Yeah, welcome all of you to this session on AMR. I'm, I'm happy to host this session. My name is Lothar Wieler. I'm the president of the Robert Koch Institute. And I have five very interesting guests today, and I hope we have some great discussions. Um, I welcome all of you. And I have to tell you that the issue of AMR is actually one of the main concerns over the past years and is also a research topic that I've been alluded over the last 20 years or so a lot. The Robert Koch Institute can best be described as a German counterpart of the CDC, but much smaller, I have to say, much smaller. It's a scientific, independent, governmental institution, and uh, the Robert Koch Institute acts as a scientific advisor to the national government at the Ministry of Health, and as such, we consult on a broad range of topics, from vaccination to zoonotic infections, from health monitoring to chronic diseases. And in this role, we are also monitoring, surveying, and also performing experimental work on AMR. AMR clearly is one of the big topics we are working on, and we're putting a lot of efforts into this particular field which is a huge challenge because it's a societal challenge, most of all. And I hope you can elude on this a little bit more in the next uh, two hours or so. It is an increasing threat to human and animal health, and it is a major challenge in global health. I think there is no question that effective antimicrobial drugs protect patients from fatal diseases, and most importantly, they ensure that complex procedures like surgery, transplantation, chemotherapy can be provided at low risk. So it's a pillar, actually, of modern medicine. Yet the inappropriate use of antibiotics, its misuse, as well as its overuse in human medicine, in food production, and very importantly also, the spillover of antibiotics into the environment promotes the development of antimicrobial resistance. So it's obviously in our hands to solve this problem because we are creating it by the use of antibiotics. The main driver, and this is a very, very important issue here, the main driver of AMR is its use. Each time antibiotics are used, development of antibiotic resistance is promoted. So we have to be very, very sensitive about it, and we have to understand this. Therefore, we need research to understand how these bacteria adapt, and we need a deep understanding of the societal impact of AMR. It's not a new problem. It has been mentioned by Fleming already when he got, had his Nobel laureate speech. And the more the bacteria adapt and strengthen the presence of antibiotics, the more they develop resistance. A conservative estimate of the current burden of AMR is around 700,000 people dying from it, but I actually have to say there is no clear burden of disease number currently, and I'm really happy that the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation takes this and in the near future will bring some numbers to life which show the problem. And this is some issue that particular National Health Institute is really interested in. We have to name the problem. We have to scale the problem. We have to know how big the challenge really is. Only when we provide true numbers can we rather for solutions. So we had a strong momentum through national and supranational activities, by, for example, by the G7 and G20 summits. However, my personal feeling is that this, so far, has mainly resulted in concentrating effort to foster the development of new antibiotics, which is very important, but mostly from a technological scientific innovation and a business model like pull and push mechanisms. However, and this is something I really want to strengthen, each new antibiotic will only give us more time, but it will not solve the problem, which is the use of antibiotics. So it's a dilemma, obviously, that we have to face, and this is really a big dilemma and a big challenge for society. And with this knowledge, uh, it's also not new. Consequently, in 2017, the WHO published a global action plan. And this is uh, the storyboard, as I was told, of this chair, Chesson here. The global action plan on AMR 
comprises of five, and not only of one, but of five key areas for intervention resembling those that are listed in the U.S. Presidential Advisory Council on combating antibiotic-resistant bacteria, the U.K.'s RMR review, or the German National Strategy DART, the German National Resistance Strategy 2020. And the five objectives, I want to name them, and they are very important. First, improve awareness and understanding of antimicrobial resistance. It's human behavior that deals with antibiotics. Obviously, it's in our hands. Second, to strengthen knowledge through surveillance and research. Third, to reduce the incidence of infection, prevention of utmost importance for whatever, the more infections you prevent, the less anti-infectives you have to use. Fourth, to optimize the use of antimicrobial agents. Fifth, to develop the economic case for sustainable investment that takes account for the needs of our countries and increase investment in new medicines, diagnostic tools, vaccines, and other interventions. And you will see on the board here, you will have mainly people talking about point number five, but again, I want to stress it, the other four points are at least as important because the other four points can lead to problem solving, while the fifth point mostly leads to buying time. In the Global Action Plan, the WHO points out that AMR will affect everybody, regardless of where people live. They will affect their health, economic circumstances, lifestyle, or behavior. This requires a whole of society engagement, including a One Health approach. And furthermore, this appropriate slogan is prevention first. Every infection prevented is one that needs no treatment. To reach sustainability, the WHO calls for national action plans on AMR, which all countries should have, including an assessment of resource needs. The implementation of these plans will require long-term investment, for instance, in surveillance, operational research, laboratories, and so on. And for promoting the technical and financial investment necessary for an effective development and implementation of national action plans, political commitment and international collaboration is needed. So finally, WHO points out the fact that member states are at a very different stage in terms of developing and implementing these national action plans to combat IMR. And this is another target. High-income countries, low- and middle-income countries have different needs and sorrows. So to have global priorities is fundamental and can only work out if we network appropriately. So as I pointed out in the very beginning, the problem we are facing is not new. Therefore, while we talk about AMR, the question raises why, if we all know about it and agree on what needs to, to be done, why haven't we fixed the problem yet? In the many years I've been working on this issue, both in veterinary and human medicine, this is a question I've frequently encountered. And the answer I tend to give is a frustrating as to many audiences as it is true. First of all, the proposed five goals for intervention are credible, difficult to achieve. Frankly spoken, we'll only be talking about antibiotic stewardship today, surveillance, but it's very important to term, take into consideration a societal as perspective, even if you have new antibiotics, even if you have new technical tools, society has to cope with it. We have to implement them. And in times of digitalization, you all know this is, I think, the highest burden uh, of what we can accomplish. Well, let me emphasize at the end of my introduction that uh, from my point of view, the importance of the goals one to four are badly underestimated. Focusing on the development of new drugs is a possibility, as I mentioned, it's important, but it's not the single solution. And with this, I hopefully uh, we're going to have a good discussion. And let me say that all the five speakers, including myself, I will also deliver a small speech. Um, I'm also very interested to learn about your experiences and ideas how to achieve the WSO strategic objectives. And this is why we have a discussion after the five or the six talks have been delivered. Thanks for attending. And now I call upon the stage, first of all, uh, Dr. Georg Schütte from the Ministry of Education and Research, from the Ministry uh, of Education and Research, as I mentioned. And um, he 
will address, among others, how the ministry not only fosters scientific endeavors and, and provides funding money, but also I think he will touch upon what can be done to improve the awareness and understanding of antimicrobial resistance from a funding agency and an agency that obviously is in charge of educating the people. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your talk. Lothar Wieler, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Just to manage expectations, um, I belong to the group that will focus on objective number five. So I will, to a larger extent, fall short of addressing uh, objective number one to four, even though I represent a Ministry of Education. What is my perspective? I talk from a perspective of a ministry that is, on the one hand, a funding agency to sponsor a research uh, directly. Uh, we are also indirectly sponsoring research through a number of independent research organizations and laboratories. We work at the interface of public administration, politics, and research, and a larger public. And in doing this, we have been addressing the question of antimicrobial resistance for quite some time. And, and Lothar Wheeler is quite right. If you look at the numbers, there might be a gross um, underestimation of number of people affected. We, we heard that 700,000 worldwide might be an underestimation. In Europe, it's about 25,000 people per year, uh, and that's the current WHO estimate. But if we get better numbers, it would certainly be better. Finding an answer to this question is necessarily complex because we've been discussing this here at the World Health Summit and in quite a number of fora for quite some time. I think one thing is clear that only if we pull our uh, efforts together, only if we coordinate our activities, not only on the national but also on the international or even global level, then we will be able to make real progress. And to that extent, it is important that the World Health Organization has uh, outlined these uh, five strategic objectives of the action plan. All goals are important, as we heard, and all goals are, in, are a basis of what we as a national federal ministry do. And yet we focus on the objectives to strengthen knowledge through surveillance and research. What exactly does this mean? It means that in the first place we have to address the question and the challenge of access to research opportunities, to research resources, to research infrastructures, and in particular to compound libraries. So this is one effort that we make to open up these resources, at least from a German perspective, to an international research community then, of course, we need shared access to knowledge across countries and across sectors in order to achieve major research successes and to do this as fast as possible. Public and private sponsors need to join forces, and I'm happy that we have public and private sponsors on this forum here and on this panel today. We all need to join forces in order to develop new models and funding schemes together in order to provide targeted incentives to the research community. And when I say research community, I mean basic research, I mean applied research, and I mean research and development that goes on in companies in the industry. And what we've seen over the recent, throughout the recent years is that industry has developed new schemes of interaction between publicly funded research organizations, laboratories, institutions of higher learning and research. And we have to further develop these uh, interfaces and joint efforts in order to make re real progress. We need regular exchange, to cut it short, between all the stakeholders involved. Funding providers need to engage with researchers and international organizations and industry and civil society, as Lothar Wieler said. We all benefit from the experiences we gain together in product development partnerships and in hospitals, uh, especially here in Berlin with the Berlin Institute of Health. We try to design 
and try to develop um, a new model of interaction between uh, um, hospital research in hospitals, in university clinics, and basic research in order to uh, design new modes of exchange and a further and more targeted way to take advantage of the massive knowledge produced in basic research and to apply this from the bench to the bedside. The World Health Summit is a splendid, a wonderful opportunity to engage in this dialogue and when I say that I really mean thank you to all those who organize sessions like this. It is important. Research funding alone, we heard this from Lothar Wieler, research funding alone will not solve the problem. It's not enough to make money available. Um, it's not enough to simply hope that novel treatments will be found against resistant bacteria. We have to change how we deal with the challenge of antimicrobial resistance. And to that extent, the Global Action Plan uh, on AMR is about to improve awareness and understanding of antimicrobial resistance. Health education is a topic. Health education is important, and when I say that as a representative of a federal ministry, let me also mention the challenges in a federal system where school systems are organized on a lender, on a state level here, and a lot of schooling happens on the local level, and yet to increase knowledge among young students and awareness is uh, something we all have to work on. And we have to create awareness with general practitioners in medicine in order not to prescribe an antibiotic for any common cold that's out there. And of course, as Lothar Wieler said, the one health approach is important. It is important that we have a unified, a common approach to veterinary medicine and uh, human medicine. It's easy to say, but when I say I'm talking from the perspective of a representative of the political system, here science becomes political and research becomes political. The German um, National Academy uh, a number of years ago, four or five years ago, um, developed a position paper on antimicrobial resistance and the One Health approach. And I was uh, witness to a vivid debate between veterinary medicines and human medicines and medical doctors to talk about the use of antibiotics in the respective fields, to talk about transparency of the use of antibiotics in the respective field, and to talk about um, finding a common language not to accuse each other, but rather to design joint approaches. Let me tell you, it's an ongoing process. It's easy to write a position paper, but to change practice in the respective fields is a challenge, and we all have to live up to really face this challenge and find solutions. We as a ministry try to bring the issue to also the transnational and international level on a European level, we work together in what we call joint programming initiatives. There is one on AMR, it's called JPI AMR. And of course, it also aims at implementing this One Health approach. Within this joint programming initiatives, national funders commit themselves to pool resources, um, but to pool resources only if the research community comes up with a joint, with a coherent research program. And this has been achieved in Europe, uh, quite a number of research institutes from Germany and other, many other European member states work together in this joint programming initiative. And for this reason, we are very happy as a national funder to provide the German share of this funding. But I said we bring the issue to the European level and even further, we try to bring it to the international level. Germany joined forces with other G G G20 countries uh, in 2017 during the German G20 presidency and together with our colleagues from the Ministry of Health uh, that looked and focused on immediate action that can be taken within the health system and the health provision system in general, we as uh, representatives of the research laboratory looked into the research field and one of the pressing needs that was immediately obvious was that we have to join forces to come up to a division of labor to address the issue of AMR. And for this reason, we 
um, we were bold enough to aim at the long haul. We aim at uh, coordinating a research policy on an international level, and we founded the AMR Research and Development Hub here in Berlin. Its objective is to make more and efficient use of the resources we have in order to develop, of course, new drugs and treatments. And we launched the hub in 2018 with 15 member countries joining forces with us from within the G20, but we now try to reach out beyond the G20 community of nations. And I'm quite happy that also the European Commission is on board, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is on board, and the Wellcome Trust is on board, and Jeremy Farrar will talk to us uh, in a few minutes. And we have WHO and OECD as observers of this AMR hub. So Berlin is home of this hub and is a center, and for this reason, it's wonderful that we meet here in Berlin. We as a national funders, we will provide about half a billion euro throughout the next 10 years uh, for the activities of the hub and the research obje objectives which are coordinated uh, under this umbrella. We hope that we will be able to enhance global coordination by this investment. It's an important issue and it's important that we talk to each other across national borders, across sectoral borders, and let me finish by inviting you to open up this dialogue here at the World Health Summit and beyond, but take advantage of the opportunity which is out here today and tomorrow, and um, let's join forces to combat AMR. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schütte. This uh, is a very important speech, and it's very important to see how much efforts Germany puts into this. Um, I'm now... Uh, Looking at Jeremy Farrar, Executive Director, that's you exactly, <laughs> uh, uh, Executive Director of the Wellcome Trust, as you may know, and he brings his thoughts to us right now. Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you. Uh, State Secretary, for, for those very uh, encouraging, encouraging words. I, I've, I've got no slides, um, and actually it would be nice if the World Health Summit committed to no slides and no ties in future um, to relieve everybody both from PowerPoint and the uncomfort of, of, of ties as well. It's just a personal plea. Um, so I've got um, three things to say, um, some of which have already been said, but just to underline. Firstly, yes, this is about infection. Um, but the reality is this is about the whole of modern medicine, and nobody should be under any uh, illusions of that. Um, the massive advances in oncology and chemotherapy, the ability to uh, do safe hip replacements, look after patients with diabetes, mother, health, mother and child health, all of that depends on being able to control infection. The second is that I think we are now at something of a tipping point because the uh, ability to intervene takes time. And if we don't start, it will always take that time. And uh, we're at that point where the number of potentially or actually today untreatable infections is growing. Um, gonorrhea, typhoid, these are becoming untreatable. And that's a very frightening scenario. The third one, and I think it's also very important for a forum like this, the World Health Summit and others, to also hold ourselves to account. We all come here, this is the 10th anniversary and there are others, the World uh, Health Assembly, United Nations General Assembly, World Economic, for a number of these forum. And I think when coming here, we have to commit to holding ourselves to account. And whilst there has been some progress, and I'll highlight some of those, the truth is as well, in other areas on this issue, we've stalled. And without a new momentum and push, and much of that is political, uh, we will not turn the tide of this uh, uh, if, if impact. Two areas I was asked to focus on, one was surveillance and one was research. So on surveillance, there still remains today too many gaps, gaps within individual countries, gaps across countries, gaps within the human sector, gaps within the animal sector. And there are certain areas where we have almost no 
information. We have to commit ourselves to getting that data and then sharing it openly because without that data, it's impossible to know what actions to take. There are gaps also in effective decision making, in truth, both amongst clinicians and public health people, but also amongst policy makers. And we, have, we can't have an effective coordinated response to AMR unless we close those gaps. This is particularly true at a time when actually science is offering us amazing opportunities. But like so much of our discussions over the next few days, science alone cannot provide the answers. And science has to be in the context of the society it's operating in. We at Welcome are very delighted to work very closely with the German government and others, and we're committed to trying to do this. We've established uh, CEDRIC, the Surveillance of Epidemiology, DRI Consortium. Uh, we're part and working very closely with the World Health Organization on their GLASS initiative and pay tribute to the British government on the work they've done with the Fleming Fund. We're working very closely with the European CDC, the American CDC, the African CDC, the Indian Council of Medical Research, um, and many, many others. Delighted, as has already been mentioned, that the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, in partnership with the Gates Foundation ourselves, are starting to put into the global burden of disease the impact of AMR. It's only when we start talking about impact will we be able to turn the tide. On the animal side, which I hope we'll hear about later, there are enormous gaps, and there's enormous siloization of people talking past each other rather than with each other. We also have to look at unconventional data. We've talked about the public health system, but of course much healthcare delivery around the world today is going on in the private sector or informal sector. And at the moment we have almost no mechanism of seeing the data from those two sectors. And we have to turn that around. The pharmaceutical industry is actually coming to the table now and sharing data and pull out Pfizer and GSK, Johnson Johnson, who are really contributing the data that they have from around the world in this combined database. On research, I think we've seen some of the best advances, and that's because, I'm not saying research is easy, but the push mechanisms, the ability to invest in fundamental science, the ability to identify new targets and new potential compounds, that in a set is the easy bit. And I think on the push areas, we have made progress. Uh, there is a better coordination of global research, and the AMR hub here in Berlin is, I think, a going to play an absolutely critical role, not in telling people what to do, but to actually identify what is being done and identify what gaps are not being filled, because then funders, including ourselves, can then help fill those gaps. But unless we know what those gaps are, we will end up all chasing the same thing. So we're absolutely delighted to be a partner in that AMR hub here in uh, Berlin. New diagnostics and new drug, drug developments are absolutely critical as well. But unless we address the failures of the antibiotic market, unless we redesign those incentives and disincentives for people to create new antibiotics and know that there is a pathway through, then we will again repeat the mistakes of the past uh, 20 years or so. And we know this market needs to be fixed. Drive AB and the Jim O'Neill review of two or three years ago highlighted what these things are. And in fact, we've asked Jim O'Neill to relook at his review and identify where we've made progress, where we are amber, and critically, where we're going potentially uh, backwards. And we firmly believe that this is going to require the public sector from governments, there's things that only governments can do, the private sector, that's industry, but it's the broad industry, it's not just the pharmaceutical industry, and we think as well the uh, um, uh, philanthropic sector has got a critical role to play. Carbex is a very good example. Guard P. Carbex and Guard P are working complementary to try and identify new targets and new antibiotics, and that is crucial because that will take time, but it won't provide the answer on its own. GHIT in Japan, uh, Health Innovation Technology, is also looking at this, and indeed Korea is starting to identify a GHIT-type mechanism for innovation and science. So the push mechanisms, I think, are not yet delivering, but I believe they will over the coming uh, five years. But attention has to be focused on the pull mechanisms, however we want to do it, advanced market commitments, vouchers, there are all sorts of ways you can incentivize industry, but unless we do this, and that must come from our political friends and colleagues, uh, we won't solve the problem. And we have relied far too long on the big pharma to identify this, when in fact a lot of the innovation will come from small and medium-sized organizations. And in fact, the big pharma on the whole is getting out of this work as we know, and we have to incentivize them to come back to the table. Because we cannot expect them to do this for charity. We cannot expect pharma, 
driven by commercial demands to do this for charitable purposes. We have to change the incentives around it. And that will require, these are global public goods, that will require uh, governments and philanthropy to step in to that space. But although we've talked about overuse and we've talked about um, misuse of antibiotics, we should also be under no illusions that most, many people around the world do not have access today to critical antibiotics that they need. So this is also an issue of equity and an equitable world that we all want to live in. And finally, just to highlight, although this is a health issue, the truth is with every healthcare system around the world struggling to work out how to pay for itself, Imagine a world where a patient with a hip operation or having cancer has to stay not one week or five days, but has to stay three weeks because of an infected hip. That adds in, in, uh, huge amounts to a healthcare system, which actually no healthcare system in the world can afford to pay for. So this is a health issue, it's an access issue, but it's also a financial issue. And we have to take this beyond the realms of ministries of health to a cross-government approach, because actually all healthcare systems around the world would collapse if antimicrobial resistance continues as it is today. So underpinning of whole of modern medicine, I believe we are at this tipping point. Uh, and thirdly, I think we've progressed in some areas, the easy bits, the push, but we've stalled in other areas. And without a new push, I think we will not address the issue. And the World Health Summit has got a critical role, but it's got to hold itself to account of why do we come here every year if we're not going to be held accountable for making a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. So actually it's me to deliver a talk, and I start with the slides that you talked about, Jeremy. From now on we will have slides, but I will uh, very briefly go through these slides just to make um, basically I, I, I want to give you an insight in a part of the work that is very very important to antibiotic stewardship and it's a technology driven talk that I will give you. So um, first of all I have to move the slides. Oh, no it works. I want to make one point clear Oftenly, we're talking about pandemics and we're talking about viruses that are transmitted basically mostly, which is the most uh, probable case of a pandemic, via aerosol. But basically, there's an ongoing silent pandemic going on with various antibiotic resistant bacteria. And specifically, if you look at the list of those that were mentioned by the WHO, it's mostly gram-negative bacteria. And the reason for this is that these are all around. You find them in all habitats. You find them in healthy people. They are part of the microbiome. And I'll just show you one example of this. And this is some analysis that we've recently done. Due to our collaborations with various countries, we are able to identify, isolate, and characterize, and unravel the genome of, for example, multi-resistant E. coli strains, and they are typed in certain genetic lineages. And what you see here is one particular lineage. These are roughly 19 strains. This is a country of origin, the outer membrane. This is the, uh, whether the patient is sick or ill, the health status. And this is the animal or the different host it's coming from. And basically what this is showing you, this, is a, this strain is popping up all over the world. It's identified mostly from infected humans because these are the index cases, basically. And you see, by whole genome genotyping, we were able to show that these are four different clades, so genetic different lineages, this what are developing. The biggest one is this one, and the most important part of this picture is that you find them in all different habitats. So the strains that are highly related, you find them in food, in animals, in water, in humans. This is what we call a one health action, and this is what I'm thriving through. We can only notice this and work on these bacteria if you isolate them from all these habitats, so we need surveillance that covers all these different areas. And this is just a calculation of how old these bugs are. They have only spread around since 2001 due to our analysis, so it's a young clone spreading and we will see hundreds of these different clones. We see real-time evolution 
driven by the use of antibiotics of humans mostly. And one of the most important misconceptions in the medical science has been that for decades we thought that if bacteria gain resistance, they lose fitness. But it's not true. It's just the opposite. We see the genetic changes in these bugs appear and they're getting even more fit, although they are resistant. We have to understand this. We have to do research on this. A very important topic. So this slide covers what I think are the big challenges we have. We have two kinds of challenges currently. And this is not only in the infectious disease area, but I pin it down to AMR control, infection control. Societal environmental change, rapidly growing world population means that the density of people, the chance of transmission of pathogens is increasing. People are mingling together. Increased international mobility is driving this in addition, of course, as we all know, but we always have to face it. Climate change has its effect on infections, no doubt about this. Water is of utmost importance when it comes to the distribution of AMR, bacteria. And of course, one issue that is very important, society has to cope with technological changes. We're talking about digitalization, but how society covers it, how to change this world is really important, and we need a lot of technical tools also to solve AMR problems. And there's a technological change, rapidly increasing data flows, big data, a big chance for gathering information but a big challenge for people to come on with it and to understand it and to, uh, to, to realize it. Accelerating technological development, change mode of communication with the public, change in vaccine compliance. So these are all issues which show the M AMR topic is down to all of these different topics. And this why it's a so-called wicked problem that needs to be addressed by various players. And now I go briefly through these slides. Uh, Germany has launched, as you know, the German um, uh, strategy for antibiotic resistance 2020, and uh, the Robert Koch Institute is a national public health institute. One big duty of us is surveillance, and I just will show you two surveillance systems that we have set up, and to, uh, that you understand how important these data are. So one is the antibiotic consumption surveillance, which was set up only four years ago. And what we're doing is, we're supporting hospitals, and we also want to go into the ambulance sector by giving data to these hospitals that gives them an idea where they are standing, a feedback mechanism on a voluntary base, which is very important, and we want to roll out this all over Germany. As it is voluntary, it takes many, many years to implement it, but we have very nice, actually very nice results, and I'll show you some of these. This is one outcome of it. If your hospital provides data, you can see on an interactive web-based tool, it's very easy to work with. If you are the hospital with this green diamond, you see how you are performing in relation to other, company, to other hospitals in Germany. It's a very important driver of innovation if you compare yourself with other in the same area, with peers, basically. And you see these are here antibiotics, you cannot read them, but you see sometimes this particular hospital is doing well, sometimes it's on the last square of these typical box plots. We can also do this, and this uh, was already mentioned by Jeremy Farrar. We can only discuss about the burden of AMR if we have these numbers, so we put it into international databases, and we can compare Germany, for example, which is here mentioned by this bubble, Germany's performance in comparison to other countries. You need to have sound data, they need to be technological sound, and they need to be really quality managed, and then you can do this. And you see that Germany, for example, when it comes to reserve group of antibiotics, is above the average of European countries. The second antibiotic resistance, uh, the second uh, um, surveillance tool that we have set up is the antibiotic resistance surveillance, basically measuring antibiotic resistance bacteria. We, more, we have no more than 8 million data, 8 million bucks in this, uh, in this database, and basically we can do a lot of analysis on this. This resistance data from routine microbiology, and this shows you briefly how it works. The practitioners or the hospitals send in their clinical samples, and then these samples are investigated in labs, and the labs give us the data. We pull them into the database, and then there's a feedback mechanism. Again, those providing the data can see the development of resistance 
in the hospitals or ambulances. Again, transparency, feedback mechanisms, peers involving. That's the most important to understand how big the problem might be. This is just a number of uh, laboratories joining us. It's a curve that goes up and it has to be much more. We want, basically, we would be happy if we have all labs and all patient practices and all hospitals. But it's a growing development. It's successful and more and more people joining this. And now I want to introduce you a new tool that is just a pilot phase. And basically this is the next step of development. It's joining these two surveillance systems together on a national base, and we call it an integrated analysis, ARS for resistance and RVS for antibiotic consumption. We now fuse these two tools, and I'll show you what, how, how big the insight is if we do this. So we analyze the data, and we provide hospitals with these newly gained insights, and now we can really ask questions how does the use of antibiotic really have an influence on resistance rates in your particular hospital, for example? This is just a technical slide. I don't want to go too much into it, but basically we are fusing these two surveillance systems into a new one, and we have a common data warehouse, and we have a synchronization with the new web server that is now working both initially in the quality management in an RKE internal network, and then we put the data out to external services so that those practitioners, those hospitals who work with us, release see the data basically on a daily basis. So what we're doing is we can pull down on hospital wards, on different disciplines. We can provide these hospitals with data, what they used on what kind of uh, resistance they have in their hospital and how does this relate to the use of antibiotics, pin it down to different types of wards. We describe not only daily doses, defined daily doses, but also risks daily doses, and we now have a resistance density that really shows the development of the resistance in this particular hospital. And each and every hospital that will be part of this endeavor will in the future have this data, and quarterly we aggregate the data. And then we can test for trends, which is really important. And it's obvious, the more hospitals we have, the better the trends can be described. Here's one outcome of this. You see here the resistance density over a certain time point. This is a confidential interval, and this here, uh, so this is the consumption, and this is the resistance density. And if you normalize this data, you'd actually see that depending on what antibiotics you use, the resistance spectrum in your hospital really changes. So this is a basis for a sound antibiotic stewardship in hospitals. And of course, we can roll this data out to other wards. We can roll it out also to the ambulance in the long run. And, and basically, um, this is what Germany does in terms of antibiotic surveillance. And this is only one small pillar on how to address this issue. Thank you very much. So now I call upon the uh, podium Jay Ayer, and she's from the Netherlands, and she will actually, I don't, I'm not quite sure what you will deliver on. I think it's also on uh, therapeutics, is it? I'll just wait for my slides. I have slides. How do I get slides up there? Do I do that? Does anyone know how I can get the slides up? Yes, here we are. Great. Uh, thank you again for the invitation and for allowing me to address you. Uh, my name is Jay Ayer. I lead the Access to Medicine Foundation. We're an independent nonprofit research organization based in the Netherlands. Uh, and what we do is we try to evaluate the pharmaceutical industry on how they're addressing the world's biggest uh, global health challenges, how they invest in access to medicine for the people living in low and middle income countries. Um, and uh, we're supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the UK and the Dutch government. So today I'm going to talk to you a bit about the, um, the issue of access to antimicrobials. It's going to be borrowing from various uh, sets of activities that we've been involved in in, uh, in a program that's called the Antimicrobial Resistance Benchmark. How does it move? While well, I figure out how to make this work, point that way. 
How did you make this work? It's not, it's not really working. <laughs> Is it not moving further? I've killed it. It's a no slides policy. <laughs> okay. No, it's okay. Uh, yeah, should, should I use this then? Yeah, and then. Oh, now it works, maybe. Let's see. Right, so um, the basic principle I think as Jeremy has already spoken about is 5 billion people already have access to essential medicines and we only need to find ways to keep that level of access available and reach the last 2 billion people to go. Many of you understand that uh, this is of course multifaceted and uh, availability, accessibility, affordability of medicines and acceptability are, are some of the major issues that are there. Now, as we already spoke a bit about this, I thought I'd put some facts and figures on the table so that we understand the magnitude of the problem. We know that today AMR causes over 700 deaths annually worldwide. Um, we cannot speak about AMR without also speaking about access. So we already know that millions of people lack access uh, to medicine despite having curable infections, pneumonia, tuberculosis, malaria. At the moment, when you look at consumption rates worldwide, um, this is rising in a worrying rate of 65% within a 15-year period. And a lot of that is also going into livestock. Uh, about 100 million tons of antibiotics is being used until today. There's a very nice ticker that's available uh, on, a, on a data counter. And a lot of that is actually being used for promoting faster growth and to compensate for unsanitary conditions that animals are raised in. And at the same time, we're seeing a sharp decline in new drug approvals to replace antibiotics for human use where there is resistance. So this is the general trend that we're facing when we're talking about the issues of AMR. Now, in order to understand what, where the solutions lie, we need to first look at the, the antibiotic market. So let's take the antibiotic market here as an example. There is definitely demand in the use of antibiotics, but a lot of that is driven by uh, the poor. Antibiotics, there's low profitability, it offers slimmer margins compared to cancer drugs, for example. And as we bring new products to the market, we are hoping to be able to conserve them, to be used only in situations where there's true need. So the type of volume guarantees are also not going to be typically expected. Moreover, there are weak links um, at various different key points, both upstream in terms of supply of active ingredients and downstream in terms of supply chains in low-middle-income countries. In fact, this is actually a global problem. So... Today, we are facing a huge um, supply problem. I took one example here of a global penicillin shortage. We won't be able to talk about use, appropriate use, without talking about access. So that's why I brought this forward. It is a fragile supply chain, uh, penicillin G, Pen G. It offers little profit. Demand is high, but again, it's coming mostly from, from poorer populations, uh, many in poorer countries, and production levels are low. There's only a few suppliers of active ingredients uh, available right now, and a lot of them are concentrated in only a few geographies. And what we're seeing is many companies, both large and small manufacturers, are leaving the anti-infective market. When you have fragile supply, what does that lead to? It leads to less optimal treatments. It leads to financial losses. A couple of examples here are shown in this study that was published in PLOS One by uh, some colleagues um, from another organization. It leads to delays uh, in uh, therapy. It leads to errors in treatment. Um, it also leads to financial losses, such as more expensive alternatives being uh, chosen instead, and increased hospital costs that Jeremy already spoke about earlier. So it is, it is a, a worrying problem that we all need to kind of work together on. So when we look together at, uh, at what WHO has actually done uh, in terms of separating the, the, the groups of antibiotics that are uh, available and offering treatment and stewardship advice on them, you see that first-line therapies, second-line therapies, and third-line therapies have all been distributed in an access, watch, and reserve group that looks this way. But what we need right now is a global governance approach, a global governance approach that brings the efforts and expertise of governments, political leaders, as was already alluded to, multilateral organizations, re regulators, and the pharmaceutical industry, you know, to solve this problem. 
And we already see some of that being done. Um, I'll give you a few examples. Um, the United States uh, FDA has recently announced a task force uh, that's really addressing drug shortages, while regulators around the world have been uh, worrying about shortages uh, for the last few years. And um, there's also a very nice coordinated group called the Interagency Supply Chain Group, which is made up of 13 global health uh, partners, and they're coll collaborating on sustaining access to various different medicines, and we hope that they pick up the issue of antibiotics also in, this, in their work. Now, we've recently published uh, um, a study uh, on this particular uh, topic, and what we did here is we also looked at how the pharmaceutical industry is addressing uh, this particular issue. Some ways that they look at it are, uh, for example, in better data sharing, in uh, demand forecasting, in stock management and being better at responding to shortages. So uh, some of that's available in the study. And we brought forward a, an example of six ideas where the pharmaceutical industry can today try to implement in order to consider um, uh, supply security for antibiotics. Agility, communicating plans early, investing in stronger supply chains, which means multi-sourcing, uh, API in ingredients, and multi-production sites so that the world has uh, security in this. But today I'm also going to be speaking about what else can be done to solve uh, access and excess problems. And we published a report early this year in, in Davos at the World Economic Forum. Uh, we launched this there, and there we, what we did is we evaluated the activity of um, the largest research-based pharmaceutical companies, a group of the major generic medicine manufacturers, and uh, biotechnology companies are responsible for some of the key innovation in, in this particular space. And, you, and we matched that against the uh, 10 fronts that were um, brought forward by the AMR review, the UK AMR review team, and the interagency coordination group on AMR. And you see there's a lot of activity in research and development. There's some activity in management of environmental risk management, and Thomas will probably speak a bit about um, how a working group within uh, the Industry Alliance has been setting uh, limits for managing discharge into, into uh, waters. And there's some activity on access, um, but, and there's also some activity on, on a stewardship uh, in, in this regard. And there's very little, of course, coming from the research-based pharmaceutical company and the generic medicine manufacturers who supply um, human health uh, products in agriculture and animal health. But some companies, like GSK and, and others, have put forward policies where they would say, we would try to make sure that our products are not going to be used uh, in, in animal health. And, uh, and if they do, we're going to have specific contracts uh, that are going to be in place to limit the level of, of usage. Um, so that kind of activity actually helps a lot. Now, when you look at the research and development pipeline, um, we've spoken uh, quite extensively about uh, the research and development pipeline in, in various different settings in the World Health Summit. At the moment, there's 276 products in the pipeline, but the worrying thing is there are very few companies that are engaged. Within that, there's a few late-stage antibiotics that will be soon reaching the market that also have a guarantee of what, what appropriate access could look like or what stewardship could look like. And only five companies are, uh, five major companies are marketing and developing vaccines for some of these priority pathogens. We're down to just these five companies for solving uh, vaccinations. And we all have heard in the previous panel about how vaccines are a cornerstone in order for us to combat AMR. Now, what's really important is when donors such as the Wellcome Trust and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation state very clearly the importance of thinking of access early and promoting that balance between appropriate access and stewardship. So we need definitely more companies to be uh, engaged in investing in research and development, and I think Thomas will speak about different uh, solutions to that. And we need definitely support for access and stewardship. Uh, for example, Carbex, sponsored by the uh, Wellcome Trust, uh, the UK, the US uh, government, and the Gates Foundation, has access and, and stewardship conditions in the contracts between innovators. Uh, Guard P, uh, another platform where, among many other funders, is supported also by Germany, the Wellcome Trust, the Swiss, and the Dutch government, um, has been uh, rewarded a best practice in engaging the industry for a, for a gonorrhea project with a small biotech company, Entasis, and recently is engaging in uh, generic uh, um, antibiotics uh, being reformulated for pediatric uses uh, with Novartis' uh, pipeline. So, um, and we hope that the, that the global AMR R&D hub that has been spoken about today um, will also have, be an important stimulus, um, and we hope that there will be a, a way to reinforce the need for good access and stewardship planning as the uh, coordinators of that interact with innovators on this. 
When we see how the pharmaceutical industry addresses the issue of use, um, you do see that there, uh, while education is something that's largely driven by governments, uh, on the ground NGOs, and um, hospital uh, systems and educators of, of the medical health, uh, medical and pharmacy, pharmacy healthcare systems. The pharmaceutical industry also has a role to play in promoting good practice uh, through education. And some companies deliver AMR-related content through a mix of activity. Um, they show a preference for some level of active learning to educate healthcare prof professionals. And we evaluate the, the industry's role in, in doing that without uh, um, a conflict of interest. So we make sure that there is no conflict of interest as they work with healthcare professionals. We've also spoken today already about um, surveillance activities. Um, at the moment, there's nine companies that are engaging in about 75 countries, and there's a, a wealth of data out there in terms of uh, how much data on, on uh, uh, where the pathogens are, what kind of resistance trends we are starting to see. And in our work, by including surveillance indicators uh, in rewarding companies uh, when, when, they, when they work with, uh, when, when they work with uh, public institutions, we promote good practice when companies participate with global surveillance networks such as the Welcome ODI project or the IHME, Global Burden of Disease, and share that level of data on surveillance trends and consumption data. So those are the kind of ways that we try to incentivize uh, um, companies. But it's step, when we come down to this, um, excessive use also uh, is stimulated by overselling. Um, and what we find worrying is there's only four companies that are right now taking steps to limit this by rethinking how their sales agents are behaving in, in, uh, in countries and how sales agents are incentivized um, to, to sell their products. And this needs to change. We need every single member of the pharmaceutical industry to take this on board and, uh, and stop the over overselling of products. So I wanted to conclude with uh, calling out for a unified approach um, and joined by my colleagues on, on stage here, that we need um, coordination, we need data, such as the ones that we provide, such as the ones that many other organizations are providing, um, to be publicly available for us to, to, to spur that change. It can't be that we're just talking about AMR in many different settings such as this, again and again and again for the next five years. Um, there's important calls to action, this is one of them. Uh, we, we had one earlier in Berlin uh, last year, and, uh, and soon there will be a call to action uh, to act on this uh, in, in Ghana later this year. The media plays an important role. Uh, we people play, play an important role. Uh, regulation plays an important role, uh, such as the 2006 uh, EU ban on growth promotion in animals, and Denmark being a large uh, exporter of pork, um, putting forward also a, a growth promotion ban for all the all their animals that are there. So as we go into the next uh, years, uh, I think we have to see how companies and countries are working together on controlling over-the-counter sales, on educating uh, people, on controlling internet sales of antibiotics. We need to increase the investments on diagnostics, uh, not only having diagnostics on the market, but also usage of diagnostics. Increase the investment and knowledge of vaccines and how amazing vaccines are and how children should need to get vaccinated and guide that optimal use. So um, we hope that um, the later discussion today will go into innovative financing gaps and spur the political discussions that we need to see in this setting and in, the, for example, the G20 setting to uh, drive this change. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayer. So the next speaker will be Dr. Thomas Cooney. He's director of the Director General of International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Associations, IFPMA, in Geneva. Thank you very much. And having listened to Jeremy, uh, please don't put up my slides. I'm not a techie. That, therefore, I would struggle with using <laughs> and moving them. And I'll happily comply next year with no tie. Uh, in terms of, uh, Jay said, the importance of media. I'm a former journalist. I know about the importance of media. But in terms of the issue of AMR, uh, when you look at AMR, oh my God, what an acronym. Therefore, what are we talking about? And we would need to, I think, develop some storytelling. The first issue really is about, could you take away the slides? I will not use them. Uh, in terms of what we are talking about, 
I'm talking about the fifth objective, the notion of developing the economic case for sustainable investment that takes account of the needs of all countries and increase investment in new medicines, diagnostic tools, vaccines, and other interventions. Uh, fairly comprehensive and fairly complex. In a nutshell, where are we right now? Not much advanced. Look at, we were, some of us together, the call to action in Berlin preceding the WHS, uh, WHS 2017, uh, call to action. At that time, the G20 ministers of agriculture agreed to ban the use of growth promoting antibiotics in industrial livestock. I haven't seen much in the media, but my recent intelligence tells me that this ban was not confirmed, rather blocked at the most recent Minister of Agriculture meeting in Argentina, because actually the ban counters interests of meatpacking industries. I must say, I'm a consumer, I'm a potential patient, I think that's quite shocking. Therefore, in terms of the economic case, it's easy. The World Health Organization quite often makes the case that the best buys for CDs would give you seven bucks in return for one dollar invested. When you look at the World Bank estimates and Jim O'Neill report and others, we talk about the hundred trillion dollar cost of AMR. When you think about how much would we need to tackle AMR, it's probably closer to 20 to 50 billion rather than trillions, which means the return on investment would be mind-boggling higher than when we talk about NCDs. But the issue is, and I think one of the issues is, it is a silent killer, as Jeremy once said. And most of us think, oh, it's far away. It's in Sicily rather than in Geneva. It's in Africa rather than in the US. And I've heard colleagues of mine tell me about talks with their ministries of finance or with their treasury. And the feeling is, oh, it's not really an issue that close to us. It doesn't hurt us. Now, let me tell you two stories. I was in June at the National Academy of Sciences meeting on better understanding the economics of antimicrobials. And the gist of the message there was, of course, everybody fully understood and behind, but I soon don't see the action yet. In terms of, let's leave aside the numbers, because the higher the numbers, the more difficult to sell them and communicate them. I learned there that actually the CEO of, I think it was Carbex, Hobby Gardner, cut himself in the garden earlier this year. I think it took eight antibiotics till he found one which worked. I also at one of these meetings ran into a colleague of mine, actually the guy in charge of the OECD, making the economic case, and he was bitten by a non-poisonous snake in the Negev desert earlier this year. He was out of action for four weeks because he developed an infection, which means it can really hit close to where you are. It can hit your kid, your wife, yourself. When I'm Swiss, therefore, of course, I'm an avid skier. Uh, I could be hurt and exposed to AMR when I have an atroscopic knee surgery. And therefore, it really affects all of us. And we can safely conclude that the cost of non-action far exceeds the cost of action. I do believe and firmly believe that in the fight against AMR, that the life science industry has a big role to play. Could you take away the slides now that I followed <laughs> Jeremy's? Uh, recommendation that we should do without slides. Show my face. It's more attractive. <laughs> uh, we in the industry, I think we do have a big role to play. And Jeremy rightly said that we see more companies getting out of the sector than companies getting into it. I do believe that actually we in the industry we do have to respond to societal expectation. And this is about responding to public health needs. But responding to public health needs and societal ex uh, expectation doesn't mean that you can do away with the market economics. I'm an economist, therefore you need the investment case. You need 
to make the argument that the opportunity costs for investing in AMR are not that much bigger than investing in immune oncology. And we actually, in May last year, 2017, we forged a coalition, a big multi-sectoral coalition of more than 100 companies, associations, from big pharma, uh, from uh, diagnostics, biotech companies, and uh, generics, where we talked about moving on all the problems of AMR, which means the environmental impact, the stewardship, the access, and the R&D. I will not go into much detail because a lot of it has already been mentioned, but I'd just like to mention two examples. We did, I gave an interview last year in Berlin about the industry's willingness and preparedness to move on the environment. I have to admit, oh my God, I got into a bit of a shitstorm internally because I shocked some of my friends from within the industry by acting rather progressively. Now, one year later, notwithstanding this immediate reaction, we two weeks ago, we announced new lower discharge targets for discharging antibiotics into the environment, where we have a great work from a manufacturing work group from big pharma companies, but we did consult with our generic colleagues because we do need to address the problem of discharge into the environment. Second issue, and I'm also quite proud, and Jay already showed it, we actually increasingly have a number of companies who recompensate and reward their sales reps not for sales, but for stewardship and for education. And we see this example followed. Therefore, we do move on quite a number of areas and we get recognition from Sally Davis, Jeremy and others. We did publish our first progress report of the AMR Industry Alliance. And I had the honor of having Jeremy at Chatham House and Dame Sally uh, and Ilona Kickbush in Geneva when we presented the data. But we also need to be aware and there, with all due respect and I look forward to our discussion to Jay, the easiest way to respond to Jay's access to medicines you know, report is get out of it, but then you disappear. I don't think that's the solution we want. That's why we need to have an honest conversation about antibiotic development and research, and I'm not a scientist, actually is still confronted with scientific challenges. We do have regulatory challenges in terms of how you conduct clinical trials. But the biggest hurdle really are the economic challenges. Because quite simply, there's no market. And I think we are well advised to look at the example of TB. And we have a number of us were in New York for the high-level meeting on TB, where, thank God, we for the first time in 50 years, we have two new medicines developed by pharma companies, J&J and Otsuka, responding to the need for MDR-TB drugs. But the problem is we don't have many actors still in the field. The issue is similar to, I think, AMR. One of the reasons why I'm really proud of what happened in the TB area is we have seen public-private partnerships. We have seen regulatory streamlining. For instance, the FDA has really uh, worked marvelously to get approval of these drugs much faster than normally would be the case. And we also see stewardship programs, delivery of these drugs to certified hospitals only, because we need to be careful not to jeopardize them. But also in, when we now look at AMR, uh, the perception, widely held perception in the media, and when I hear Jim O'Neill, he said, you know, for God's sake, invest in research, all your companies are getting out. The reality actually is still quite different. In our AMR progress report, which we present in January, counterintuitively for many observers, we demonstrated that in 2016, the latest figures available, the private sector invested more than $2 billion into development of new AMR uh, medicines and vaccines. More than $2 billion. 
conservative estimate because not all companies participated and responded. That, when we looked at the BCG report, and I discussed it with the OECD, is four times as much as all governments together uh, you know, invested. But also, with all due respect to the 500 uh, million euro from Germany, and I really welcome the German leadership on that, and what the UK would welcome trust Jeremy and the government and Sally Davis are doing, the CARBEX work, but even the two billion aren't a drop in the ocean. We will not get the new antibiotics we need with these investments. The problem on top of that is half of the respondents in our survey honestly stated that unless we get incentives, and incentives really creating a market soon, we are likely to reduce our investment. And we have seen over the last just couple of years several companies getting out of AMR of antibiotics research. I think we are well advised to have a call to action and move fast on the incentives. In terms of what the incentives should look like, again, extremely honestly, one of our problems in the industry, we were seen as a little bit all over the place until at least two years ago. Because we had dogmatic support for IP incentives on the one hand and on the other hand, it's advanced market commitments and market entry rewards, and the two sides could really not get together. We have managed this internal schism over the last two years, and we now really advocate extremely pragmatically a suite of incentives. And I will not say it has to be this one or that one. Jeremy actually listed all of them. In my view, to push incentives are extremely important, but my, for instance, association and also the AMR Industry Association, we have our headquarters in the former building of Serono in Geneva. I was extremely pleased when I read in the FT recently that Ernesto Bertarelli invested serious money in getting the pipeline antibiotics from Novartis. Great. But I would bet that he counts on your willingness from the governments, my ability to lobby, he knows me, uh, to get from talk to action on incentives. Now, the incentives could be multifold. For instance, Scott Gottlieb, the FDA commissioner, recently made a strong pitch for reimbursement reform. Because right now the challenge is with the normal ISO, HTR, HTA and normal economic evaluation, you will never get the money and the sales you need to justify an investment, even if you do away with the normal opportunity cost and you do accept that you will not get the same return as on a blockbuster cancer drug. Therefore, reimbursement reform could really play a role, but it has to be funded. Second element, certainly, is the market entry reward. At the call to action last year, Lord O'Neill really expressed his impatience for the industry not moving, notwithstanding the consensus of everyone that reimbursement, uh, market entry reward should be done. I did dare to explain to him that signing a declaration in Hamburg was not the same as signing a $20 billion check. Therefore, the move from, you know, agreeing to putting real money in there. And there the problem, of course, be it Washington, be it Tokyo or other countries, that you really, I can't see the big numbers coming forward yet. Therefore, a third element could be, for instance, IP incentives. Jay mentioned it, Jeremy mentioned it, that the notion that a company which invests successfully into a priority antibiotic should be allowed to get the voucher which they can use for something else. Similar vouchers, for instance, were used in uh, market approval, for instance, priority review vouchers. But I could imagine, and you really need serious numbers, one could easily uh, set up such a scheme. The big advantage would be you don't need the money up front. It would be extended over years. I do believe that we really need to make progress. And in conclusion, I really want to, you know, reaffirm a call to action. Within the last two years, we have seen five large pharma companies and many biotech companies exiting the space. We see the impact of the push incentives, and I strongly welcome and support all the efforts of Gartby, Carbex, uh, the Berlin Hub, 
It is truly important. But when I talk to my colleagues from Bio, when we talk to the startup companies in the AMR industry alliance, they're extremely transparent and honest. We will need big pharma to re-enter the scene because the time you need to come for development, the numbers are too big for the small companies to bear. And I don't see the, the governments doing it because the risk of failure in phase two or phase three trials is still there. The current economic incentives focus simply on push incentives. And as I said, I would not at all discourage governments to do away with the push incentives, but we really need to have a serious and urgent conversation, hopefully we'll have one in Accra in November, on how to create the market, because basically at the end of the day, market reward for those who succeed are much more efficient than subsidizing across the board. And governments really need to come forward, and I would expect and hope for a coalition of the willing. I have some hopes in the government of Japan, because they in the past in G20 and G7 have put AMR on the agenda. I've actually traveled to Tokyo a couple of times earlier this year. I'm reasonably confident, but we really need, I think, enlightened government leaders like Angela Merkel, because she has been a champion of that. We need senior officials like Dame Sally, who championed this, and I also, uh, very warmly welcome the support from philanthropy because at the end of the day, this is about a public health need and maybe the biggest we face. Thank you. Thanks indeed, uh, Thomas. Well, the last speak before we open the round of discussion will be Rolf Müller. He's director of the Helmholtz Institute for Pharmaceutical Research in the Saarland. Federal State Saarland, for those who are not from Germany, one of the 16 federal states. Well, welcome everybody. I uh, kept asking myself why I was put up last in this line, but I realized Thomas' uh, example when you cut your finger doing some gardening work, uh, at the end of the day it would be awfully nice to have that eighth antibiotic that would work. Um, so maybe there is some value, although we have heard the numbers, to try still generate new antibiotics, and that's what our institution tries to do. Um, although it's, it's, uh, it's a bar that is set very high, um, I'm kind of representing a species that is going extinct, uh, people who try to do it. And uh, after all these uh, top-down talks, I'm happy to give a more bottom-up perspective what, of what as a scientific researcher in academia you can try to do. So I'm representing the Helmholtz Institute and the Helmholtz Center as well as the uh, German Center for Infection Research. Um, at Helmholtz um, the idea is tackle the grand challenges and there's a Helmholtz Center for Infection Research up in the north in Braunschweig where there are three main topics. Uh, which are host pathogen and anti-infectives, and especially the anti-infective topic has teamed up over the last couple of years in a virtual center, which the German ministry founded like five or six years ago, um, which deals um, with the close interaction with medicinal microbiologists and medicine, so really we can, we can work on where the medical need is thought to be. And within that center, there is a larger team of scientists in Jena and Bonn and Tübingen on other sites who try to tackle AMR from the compound perspective. And we've recently also moved this into the JPI AMR perspective, which uh, Dr. Schütter mentioned, and we're trying to extend the network there. Um, Actually, it's very timely because right after this session, there will be an antibiotic research and development session organized by the German Center, where we have a perspective, a broader overview of what is done in the center by Heike Brötz, and then we'll have the perspective of academia, industry, and also public-private partnerships. So I encourage you to go there. We've heard about the challenge, right, gram-negative bacteria, and I want to emphasize 
a few more things. Um, of course, everything has been said, not by me, um, so I'll try to say something different. Um, the priority list is full of gram-negative bacteria. I don't know whether everybody thought about this and what it actually means. As a pharmacist, you have to get the drug to the side of action. And there are so many obstacles that you have to get across when you want to treat a patient. The drug has to be stable in the body. It has to reach the site of infection. But at the end of the day, it also has to get inside of the bacterium. And in order to get inside of the bacterium, it has to cross membranes. And I'm putting the plural up here because this is a major difference to the typical eukaryotic membrane where there is just one. And especially the gram-negatives have two membranes and the physical chemical properties, the pharmaceutical properties of the compound to be discovered is really, really difficult. And that is a main challenge in the industry which has not been overcome and it is not clearly understood. One could also say it's basically not understood at all what needs to be done to a molecule so it can enter the cell. And this is why we believe into natural products quite a bit because other bacteria, other microorganisms in the course of evolution have learned how to do the trick and that's what we want to learn from natural products. So we've seen this, uh, not many new antibiotics have been brought to the market. Um, most importantly, uh, very few ones are active against gram-negatives. Uh, we've heard about Pharma's retreat, we've heard about the lack of new anti-gram-negative compounds which are brought to the market, and therefore one of our foci is look what nature has done, and traditionally this is also what is used in the pharmacy and in the med medical application. 80% of the antibiotics which are used are either natural products or natural product derived. And this is because they are chemically different and they are evolutionary optimized. And there are many good examples for natural products that were and are the base for compounds which are used in medicine. A few examples are given here. Artemisinin as a, the top anti-malarial penicillin has been mentioned and also anti-cancer compounds. So I would like to emphasize maybe in one or two Chairman has asked me to shorten this presentation, so I'll skip some slides. Examples how modern approaches towards natural products may provide us with some chances for novel antibiotics. Um, how do we do natural products? It's largely based on biodiversity. The uh, microbes we are discussing here are mostly pathogens, uh, but there are many friends out there. We've heard about E. coli being member of the gut, so we need E. coli, and uh, most of the antibacterials which are on the market come from microbes. But only 1% of the microbes on the globe have been cultured in the lab. So uh, we really need to think about ways to culture these microorganisms. And this brings me to a point uh, where we also need to think about the way how we measure the impact of our work. Uh, very often this is mostly done by impact factors, but uh, what about the microbiology, which is kind of left over, which is hardly done in the lab, so what about the preclinical development, which usually doesn't lead to big research papers. So we try to work on the microbiology side, combine this with genomics, also combine this with modern technologies to identify compounds which are known pretty fast, so uh, we can rather focus on such which are new to us. And uh, what has really been a game changer in this over the last 20 years is databases, information-based systems which help us overcome hurdles which uh, made pharmaceutical industry basically give up this field in the late 90s. And uh, within the German Center of Infection Research, there's a, a larger compound library, which is also something that the State Secretary has mentioned. Um, just one example for the bacteria out there. This is myxobacteria. Don't worry, they are non-pathogenic, but they are predatory. So they can glide over even surfaces, they can kill other bacteria, and they produce a large amount of uh, natural products which have not been harvested for any application. And we really need the efforts of basic researchers to get hold of these compounds. 
And in order to do this, we can nowadays also genome sequence them. We can find the genes, we can modify the genes, um, and starting from this, make new material, make new compounds, and learn how these compounds work, learn whether they work on attractive new targets or old targets, maybe with new sites of action. And from this work, I would just like to emphasize that we can really find new chemistry. This is often put into question. Here's just a, a list of uh, compounds which are completely new. This is also a, a common difficulty. You cannot buy them in the Aldrich catalog. Um, this is new producers, new chemistry, addressing new targets. And for the rest of the talk, I will focus on, on two examples of such compounds which we tried with uh, the best of our knowledge to move into public-private partnerships or into collaborations with pharmaceutical industry. We've heard that many of these are not active anymore, uh, but if you want to replace them with SMEs, the ideas for the SMEs must come from somewhere, and if there's no next generation scientists, which in our field we really have to teach, um, there will be no ideas. So it's not that the SMEs uh, grow on ideas which would not come out of academia. So here's one example. Um, this is a completely novel compound class which we came across from a new bacterium uh, which uh, really excited us because it's active against most of the gram-negative species. We then tried to decipher how it works, what its mode of action is, this we can nowadays do by genome sequencing of the bacteria and trying to decipher how they become resistant. Actually, this may be uh, not easy to grasp paradigm. If you think about a bacterium making an antibiotic, it has to protect itself. And uh, when we study the self-protection mechanism, we can relatively easily decipher what it actually does. And in this case, this helped us to decipher that these compounds uh, inhibit gyrase, and gyrase is the target of the fluoroquinolones, and that's uh, shown on this slide. Now, coming back to the power of bioinformatics and metabolomics, we now have this database that holds all of the data of thousands of these bacteria, and we can in silico back, go back into this database and ask the question, are there additional producers of the same compound class? And nature has usually generated a whole, a whole series of derivatives of compounds to uh, check out what, we, what the chemist calls the structure activity relationship. And based on this, you can expect that there are compounds which do their job better than others. And uh, this then led to highly improved derivatives, natural congeners, as we call them, and they were also highly active against pseudomonads. So we were very happy with this uh, compound class, which we called 861, according to its mass. And uh, over the last couple of years, with the help of funds of uh, DZIF, the German Center, and also the Innovative Medicines Initiative, we were able to run these through a lot of preclinical analyses. Um, I just want to summarize these for the, you. They basically show they are highly active on all of the escape pathogens. Toxicity seems to be limited, and it's worth to continue with this compound class. And that's a stage where most of the compounds in academia would already get lost. Because although we have all these push incentives, there is if there are no networks, there is not the knowledge in academia to really help and push these compounds to a stage where pharma companies would pick them up. Um, we've then managed to completely, totally synthesize the compound class. We moved them into a proof of concept. Clinical proof of concept uh, is not in, in humans first, but in animals. So this is an infection model in a thigh infection model in E. coli. And what you can see here is that this compound class proves to be almost as efficient of, as levofloxacin, uh, which is a first-line um, fluoroquinolone antibiotic by reducing the burden by 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 orders of magnitude. So this class is really promising. And we've now achieved proof of concept. 
Uh, you may ask the question, why are they doing this? There are fluoroquinolones. We do not see signs, heavy signs of cross resistance. If you have fluoroquinolone resistance, this compound class would still work because it has a different binding site on, flu on, on gyrase and it is not exported uh, by the typical efflux pump that throw out the antibiotics from the cells. And uh, I, I'm, uh, I dare to say that we have come quite far in negotiations with GARP-P and also Evotech. Evotech took over the uh, part of Sanofi that was involved in developing antibiotics, and uh, we hope to close a deal with them for public-private partnership and direct interaction of development of these compounds. So I'm just emphasizing this because it's, it's a really a long road since we discovered this compound classes seven years ago. And typically, it's really tough in academia to keep going, as not all of these steps are coming in parallel with the typical publications you need for your next evaluation. And this is also a political issue to address how do we measure the impact of what we actually do. I would like to uh, skip these slides and just go into a second example to uh, end this talk up with. This is a compound class that we worked on together with Sanofi. Um, it's a very old antibiotic. It's known to work on TB. It's uh, super active on TB, but as soon as it sees blood plasma, it disintegrates and it's not active. So in a large program together with Anu Sanofi, we discovered where the degradation of this compound starts, and we then used engineering tools to modify this compound class in a way that it is plasma stable. It's strong antibactericidal. It's uh, orally bioactive, and this led then to the production of this compound class in amounts, so it could be first also used for a proof of concept study. And that was done in, in Jacques Rosset's lab, what you see here is an infection model, again in mice. They infect the mice, you wait for two weeks, you measure the burden, and then you start the typical triple treatment that is used to treat TB. And uh, it takes typically 12 weeks until the mice clear the infection. And when you replace one of these antibiotics with grizzlymycin, that's the name of the compound, um, you can reduce the treatment period to eight weeks. This in itself is uh, quite promising, quite interesting. But at that time, what was even more um, exciting to us was the fact that there's no cross-resistance with this compound class to any of the known antibiotics. And this led to a, a long program which we ran through to eventually decipher a completely new target, which is the DNA sliding clamp. So that's a protein which wraps around DNA. And to this protein, the DNA polymerase and also the enzymes involved in DNA repair have to attach. Otherwise, there is no DNA amplification and there is no DNA repair. And uh, by binding at the interface and inhibiting the protein-protein interaction, this molecule um, it does exactly this, and by this it also explains why there's no cross-resistance. It's a new target, and uh, we do not see any significant resistance that occurs. And based on this project, we have also started modifying the molecule and trying to make this also work in gram-negatives. So with this, uh, I would like to stop. I hope that I could give a, a small intro in what is done in academic labs towards um, the, uh, say, identification and development of new antibiotics. I have to thank a lot of partners and group members. I'd like to especially emphasize the coordinated work in the German Center Infection Research with our sites in Jena and Tübingen and in Bonn um, who, who work on these antibiotics and we hope to extend this network further and although the bar is very high, this is how I try to motivate the people who work with us. I mean, if we don't do it, currently uh, the pharmaceutical industry is not going to do it. And our idea is somehow, and somebody will be lucky at the end of the day, I'm convinced if it's not us, it's some other organization who still puts the energy into this work. Uh, with this, I would like to close, and thank you.
Thank you very much. Wolf, thanks indeed. So, I sensed it in the, from the beginning. We will always talk about antibiotic, uh, new medical, new therapeutics development. I can tell you we will soon publish a paper before we open the floor, of course. Uh, there are two microphones and also I think two uh, people are going through and with, with mics. We will soon publish a paper showing that Germany, among nosocomial infections, is over the average uh, in Europe. And the reason not being Germany hospital nosocomial infections, the, U, the, the reason not being that Germany is particularly bad in hygienic measures in the hospital, but too many Germans like to go to the hospital. Last year, nearly 20 million Germans went to hospital. If we would do a lot of service outside of hospitals, we would reduce the number of nosocomial infections by more than 15%. And all these people that get infections don't have to be treated. So there are various other ways. I always just try to remember you to tackle antibiotic resistance. Although, again, antibiotic, new antibiotics are important, but they don't solve the problem. They buy time. As far as we, are know, we know, there is no single antibiotic that has not uh, led to a new resistance. Because, as Rolf mentioned, the natural products are around, and of course there are bugs that are resistant against these natural products, otherwise they couldn't produce them. So, but the, given this perspective from a purely public health point of view, um, we heard a wealth of talks, and I open the floor for questions now, please. So here vorne, stay, okay. and then over there in the second row, and over there in the seventh row. Indeed. My name is Konrad Reinhardt, and I'm the chair of the Global Sepsis Alliance. And um, it was rightly said that we need a holistic approach to tackle this problem. And Dr. Detres has said that it's a tragedy that more of the six million deaths from sepsis, which is the final common pathway of infection, is preventable. And it was mentioned that vaccination, clean care, and access to effective antimicrobials is key. And what is also very important, that there is a wealth of data that any delay on antimicrobials per hour in patients with sepsis increases mortality by 2%. So that's why we need educate physicians not only to not use antimicrobials in patients who have clearly no bacterial infection, but also and, not, and also to stop antimicrobials when they are no longer needed, but also educate lay people how to protect themselves by vaccination, to seek for the doctor when they have the early signs of infection and educate also healthcare workers to detect these patients early. So that's why I strongly believe that we should combine these campaigns against AMR with the education to prevent infections, to detect them early and to treat them appropriately. So that's, I think, uh, we need to get out of the silo, but people, and because people only understand the need to fight AMR if they understand uh, what else needs to be done to protect themselves from these deadly diseases. It's a very valuable comment. Networking and, and uh, pulling down barriers is, of course, of, of utmost importance. So there was... Uh, yeah, you already have a mic. Oh, yeah. So if you have a question, address it to one of the... Speakers here. Sure. Uh, I actually, my name is Mojuk. Uh, I'm a doctor based in Sweden. So I have a question. Uh, I actually have two questions. One is related to the high resource settings, and one is to the low resources settings. So my first question was inclined to my previous speaker. So this is uh, I heard about the German surveillance systems, which is quite impressive. And I also wanted to know if you have any initiatives for precision of antibiotic use in specific clinical protocols in disease-based in certain departments or all. 
So that's my first part of question. And the second part of question is to Jayashri, uh, because you're working in the low middle income countries as well. Uh, so when I was working with uh, Intermatic Research uh, Resistance, we found uncontrolled retailers as well. So do you have any um, insights on how to address these issues and their relations with the pharmaceuticals and, and the policymakers? Thank you. Should I start with the second one? <coughs> Excuse me. So um, there's a lot that one can do when it comes to uncontrollable over-the-counter use. I think it's... Um, uh, in terms of where the pharmaceutical industry can play that role, I think managing the fact that they will not, there's only, uh, they can only go as far as where the point of sale is going to be. But having quite clear contracts to the distributors and to anyone downstream that says we will hold you accountable for how it is going to be used downstream is, is an important aspect that I think some companies are thinking about at the moment. Uh, passing that, that, that good practice standard downstream I think is quite important. Uh, there are a few companies that are, that are looking at this particular issue, um, but I th again, it's, it's a place where there needs to be regulation at a country level to complement that. There needs to be, uh, for example, in India, there's something called the Chennai Declaration, uh, where there's a limit of uh, over-the-counter sales and internet sales of, of products. So those kind of things, I think, help to engage the industry. The first one, I think, is... Actually, I didn't understand this question. Oh, actually, my first question was, uh, do you have any initiatives for... I mean, antibiotic use in clinical protocols in specific diseases. Sure, um, yes. So these are antibiotic stewardships, and there are various uh, on, on, on a local level. But there can be, many of those can be transformed. There are courses. There's a lot of going on in, in education of people. Um, there are courses from the, the uh, so-called societies that are doing this. But this is a, um, basically, it's, it's there, there is, there is, is still a lot of it is voluntary. A lot of it is voluntary, and it's very much based on the physicians themselves to push for it. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Here. Okay, Robert Sebag, specialist on infectious diseases in La Pitié Salpetrière in Paris. I just want to tell you what is the life of a specialist of infectious disease, a daily life in a big department in Paris. Three main problems. We have a big increase of STI, mainly syphilis, three to four new cases per week. And when we want to prescribe long-acting penicillin shortage, very difficult to find. Second one, big increase of gonorrhea resistant, chlamydia resistant, no new drug, but this is, we have the patient in front of us. And the third one, perhaps you are not uh, aware about that, it's about Lyme disease. You, you heard about Lyme disease. And now is a big fight between infectiologists. Two schools. One, they say, it doesn't exist chronic life, Lyme disease. Some exist Lyme, chronic Lyme disease. It, it's become now a big business. And some of doctors, you have Lyme clinics in Germany, Lyme clinic in France, in some country, they prescribe without any scientific facts many antibiotics, six to ten different antibiotics during six to seven months, how you want, you will increase AMR. And all scientific uh, academy in France, in Germany, they say no, Lyme, chronic Lyme disease, but they maintain pressure on the patient, you have to see on the internet site, and they prescribe antibiotics, antibiotics, six, seven again, during six or seven months, and I think it's a shame, and I think the scientific community, they have to fight about this type of prescription. Thank you. Thanks indeed. Uh, I think there's nothing to add. This is the part of education, the part of stewardship, professionalism, that is very, very important, for sure. For sure. Thank you. My name is Martina Gliba. I work at Institut Merieux. Uh, I think if I recall well, Jim O'Neill said if there was only one thing to do, it would be to focus on diagnostics. And I would like to ask the panelists uh, if they have some ideas uh, how to incentivize better use of diagnostics. Thank you. Thanks. Well, one is easily with the health insurance system, if you get paid for it in Germany, you will put more uh, efforts into diagnostics, a very easy incentive. 
any other incentives? Of course, there's also a lot of uh, diagnostic research. Yeah, um, so I think the, the, the commitment on, on uh, AMR that multiple companies came together in did reinforce uh, a couple of diagnostic companies to get on board and, and recognize that diagnostics plays an important role. So you see some effort coming from Roche, for example, from uh, Merck KGA, the, the German Merck KGA, um, in bringing forward their diagnostic platforms. I think an important platform is the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, uh, FIND, which is a mechanism supported by multiple donor governments to find new diagnostics that are cost effective and simple to use at the, at the bedside, um, you know, redirecting that to make sure that it targets some of the AMR priority pathogens would be a critical uh, component of, of some of the some of the work that we see. So, Heike Potz, Österhelt, University of Tübingen. I'm here. Okay. So my question goes to Jane Eyer because um, did I get you right that you said there were 276 agents in the pipeline for um, antimicrobials in terms of antimicrobial agents? I mean, this number obviously is far beyond or far bigger than the number of antibiotics in development. And there is a WHO report from 2017 that states this nicely. And I just wanted to um, put this in a perspective because all um, agents in late stage development are old in new classes of cephalosporins in combinations with old in new classes of beta lactamase inhibitors. There are derivatives of tetracyclines, um, of quinolones, of aminoglycosides, but the number of new classes with new mechanisms in development is less than a handful, most of them early, and I think this is important. Maybe you could comment on this. Uh, yes, that's true. So there are 276 uh, projects in the pipeline uh, targeting the priority pathogens. Out of that, as you mentioned, a lot of them are also repurposing uh, um, and minor modifications. And when we looked at novel compounds, um, I think the number uh, was only a handful, as you mentioned. It was nine, if I remember correctly. And um, when you do look at those compounds and whether they're going to be made accessible appropriately and whether the surveillance programs is also going to be um, in, in place for those nine, it's, again, few and far between. So this is a very worrisome uh, trend that, uh, that we need to look at. And also when you look today at uh, how many companies are investing in, in that very few number of novel compounds, it's diminishing. So some companies have made available their compounds for, for licensure and for further development. Uh, some companies are looking at transition periods to, to uh, make sure that products are going to be made available for um, uh, patent pool um, or uh, screening uh, purposes itself. But you do need a commercial partner to bring a lot of these products and manufacture them uh, at the scale when you do have something in place. So this is a worrying trend that a lot of biotech companies are also um, thinking about. Any further questions? Oh, Please. It's actually a follow-on from the last question, because um, when we're talking about the, the narrowness of the... Well, it's not just the pipeline, it's the breadth and the novelty of it. So the last question was about the lack of novelty. The last speaker talked about natural products, which I was glad to hear. I wonder what the other people on the panel thought of that as uh, an approach to um, increasing the novelty of the pipeline. Natural products. Uh, plants, fungi, incredible compounds that, you know, 12,000 compounds that plants produce, and we've only looked at about 10 or 20% of them. Not just the end speaker, but the other speaker. I'm curious. I think we have to explore every possible avenue, but if I may add a little bit of spice to this one, I mentioned it to Professor Muller in our prep talk, uh, CBD may actually add complications rather than resolve them, uh, because when I think about natural you know, resource research, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about benefit sharing and not that much about benefit generation. Uh, I see, for instance, big potential uh, hassles right now when we talk about uh, the next flu, sh flu shots. The moment you get into CBD, you get my people running for cover. And that, I think, is a challenge which we also honestly need to debate. No, I have nothing much, much to add other, other than that science tends to work along tram lines and uh, the fact that the exploration of space for new 
antibiotics, new antivirals, etc., tends to focus on a very small area is something we all should be fighting against. It's actually the same in many areas of science. Of the human genome, only about 10% of it is being explored at the moment for potential impacts on, on disease. And anything which takes us out of that space and into new spaces should be encouraged. Um, I spent the last 18 years living in Vietnam and was very involved in the development of artemisinin, uh, artesanate, which you heard in one of the talks. And there's no doubt that many of the new compounds that are coming up will come from spaces that people have not yet described. Um, but, but that requires innovative funding, risk-taking, and ability to think outside the box, including from those people that review grants and things. Um, hello, um, my name is Reinhard Benning. From, I'm from the civil society from the um, environmental and development group German Watch. And my question is on antimicrobial resistances um, on meat and animal products. So we see a special situation in Europe. We reduced in many countries in Europe antimicrobial use in animals. Also in Germany, we halved antimicrobial use since 2011. But we see that the resistant rates on meat, for example, don't decrease in that rate. We have still, for example, 66% um, poultry meat in supermarkets is uh, contaminated with ESBL producing bacteria. And also every fifth pig meat um, uh, um, has these ESBL producing bacteria. Um, from our um, agriculture ministries all over Europe, we see um, no investment in better housing of animals, even if uh, we heard this morning from the, w, uh, from the um, WHO that better housing leads to less antimicrobial use and maybe also less uh, resistances, we don't see so much investments on it. So as we talked before on investments for combating our AMR, is it necessary from your point of view to de-invest in industrial farming and in meat trade which is contaminated with um, AMR? Thank you. <laughs> uh, actually, I don't know whether uh, this panel is the best to answer this. Obviously, nobody is raising his hands, but it, it is... It, okay, she gives a question. Okay, all right, you know, I'm going to try, and someone in the audience can help. Um, I think in the Netherlands is a classic example of a, of a country where there's quite strict regulation in terms of uh, the sanitary conditions of, of animals, and that is still being reformed uh, to make it improved. We actually have... Uh, one of the few, we, um, I'm a resident and I'm not a Dutch uh, citizen, but in the Netherlands there's also a, um, quite a strong uh, ban on, on uh, growth promotion in uh, farmed animals. So that complemented with uh, usage and you can't get an antibiotic when you go to a doctor as a, for, for human health unless you're really um, coming up with a, with a life-threatening uh, infection itself. So I think the combination of human health interventions, animal health uh, promotion and, and, um, and animal sanitation and some level of water and sanitation uh, improvements is the combination that we need to invest in as a total. Hi, so I'm Laura Piddock, Head of Scientific Affairs at the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership. And I just wish to bring to everyone's attention that the one model you haven't discussed today when you were talking about approaches to uh, incentivize development of antibiotics is the not-for-profit approach, which is the one taken by Gard P. Um, and I'm not going to preempt anything because I am actually talking in the next workshop about Gard P, but I would like to hear from the panel whether uh, taking the approach taken successfully by drugs for neglected diseases, which is the approach that Gard P is going to be adopting, do you think that this could be rolled out by other organizations in partnership with GARP or indeed in partnership with some of the people talking today? 
Maybe a quick reaction from my side. We have very good interaction in Geneva with GARDP as well as with FIND. And I see companies cooperating freely and actually you know, sharing uh, their pipeline with GARDP uh, for repurposing. But let's not kid ourselves. This approach on its own will not solve the problem. Very much welcome it, but on its own it will not solve the problem. It's about repurposing, it's about finding new uses for old products. It's not about novel. And one of the questions which was about the novelty, when I talk to my colleagues from the industry, we actually have pretty impressive numbers, as Jay said. When you look at the quality of the numbers in terms of novelty, I haven't heard any of my colleagues in the industry say that the numbers are as impressive when it comes to really novel breakthrough. That's why we really need investment. Can I just come back at that, please? Sorry, it's just not just about repurposing. And it's really important to say, as I will be saying, we are working with a small company to develop a novel chemical entity. We're not talking about replacing any of the current actors. We're talking about there's many different ways to develop new drugs, and we are one of them. Thank I you. was going to add that. Um, and, and call out for the fact that the nonprofit model, I think, has uh, proven, and we've shown that in our data, to engage uh, many of the pharmaceutical industries, both research-based and the biotech sector, and ensure that at least access planning and, and stewardship planning is also brought in, into place, and especially when it comes to the poorest region of the uh, regions of the world where it's often uh, neglected when it comes to uh, prioritizing registration or supply. Uh, the nonprofit sector plays an important role, so I, we think the Guard P model uh, can be expanded. Is it urgent? If not, no, we, you know, this is a tight uh, uh, World Health Summit and uh, time is so tight at, uh, today. So, so I'd like to thank all the speakers on the podium here. I'd like to thank all of you for taking part in these discussions. It has been a lively discussion. I think you've seen the magnitude of the problem uh, and, and obviously there's no simple solution to it. So thanks for all of you. See you soon.